Okay, the first um, a a question we've had is what is a GMO and what is the difference in genetically modified, or modified organisms and genetically engineered organisms? And that sounds like a really simple question, but it's not quite as simple as it seems or might appear. So we know there's a lot of uh, uh, mistrust of uh, genetic engineered uh, organisms or genetic engineering, GMOs, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it's but what the true definition is not real clear. And part of that is because genetically modified organism, which is what GMO stands for, is not really a scientific term. As far as I can tell, the, uh, the term came about uh, through the media, uh, possibly through activists. Uh, scientists never used to refer to uh, or use the word GMOs. They referred to something like transgenics or maybe genetic engineering, uh, terms like that. But now GMOs got it's, it's gotten to be very uh, commonplace, and you'll even hear scientists uh, uh, refer to it from time to time. But it, it really refers to a, a lot of techniques. And in fact, some people would argue that, uh, that GMO includes a, a lot of crops that we've been eating for a long time. Uh, and in fact, we have been manipulating DNA in animals for thousands of years. Uh, on the top left here you see T.O. Sinti uh, compared to modern corn and certainly they don't look alike. Uh, you can tell by the quarter how small that ear is on T.O. Uh The kernels were very hard, not very digestible. Uh, they, the kernels would fall off. Um, uh, they wouldn't stay on the plant, so it was hard to harvest. Um, uh, so there was, there's a lot of advantages to what man has selected over thousands of years uh, in modern corn compared to its its uh, ancestors. Likewise, you see on the on the right there, you see carrots, and it wasn't until the 1700s that we had orange carrots, and the white uh, carrot-looking roots you see there are uh, the ancestors of, of the carrots we eat today. And on the bottom left there, you see uh, a wild ancestor uh, of tomatoes, uh, that very small tomato compared to the one of the types of tomatoes that we have available today. So man has certainly uh, manipulated uh, DNA in plants for a long time. Uh, here's an example from one species, and what we see in the middle there is wild cabbage, and uh, all these uh, vegetables that you see on the slide originated or were selected by man from this wild cabbage in the middle. They're all the same species. And on the top left you have cabbage, the top middle you have kale, and then broccoli on the top right, uh, Brussels sprouts uh, on the lower left, uh, kohlrabi on, on the bottom, and cauliflower on the bottom right. So all those are the same species uh, and they certainly look differently. Uh, and this is what man did, is, is he took that Brassica oleracea, which is, is the wild cabbage, and selected for different um, plant parts, and uh, that's how we came up with some of the vegetables we have today, and that you might find in the supermarket. So what is a GM? Uh, and I looked up on dictionary.com, and then it says it's a genetically modified organism, an organism or microorganism whose genetic material has been altered by means of genetic engineering. Uh, and that's not real clear because exactly what is genetic engineering? We'll see that there's, there's a host of tools that people use for genetic engineering. Um, genetic engineering, also called genetic modification, is a direct manipulation of an organ organisms genome using biotechnology. So I guess that's how maybe how we would, we're using biotechnology is how we would do, just, uh, make a distinction from uh, uh, for genetic engineering. And for most people that's what they would de uh, define as a GMO. Although when we de break down GMOs even further, or genetic engineering either further, uh, you might see that some people might call some uses of biotechnology uh, GMO and others possibly not. 
so when we look transgenic, now that's probably the classic case that most of the public would consider uh, uh, a GMO, the one they're most aware of, and that's when a gene is moved from one non-closely related species to another. So this could be a, a uh, species that are um, incompatible as a fish and a tomato, which is often what you see on the internet. <coughs> now there is no uh, commercially available product where uh, we've moved the animal gene into a plant, but certainly that would be possible with transgenics. Cisgenics or intragenics, uh, they're, they're pretty much the same, and they both involve moving a gene uh, from with the, within the same species or a close, more close, uh, closely related species, uh, and close enough that that breeding, sexual breeding, would be possible. So uh, some people are less opposed to that, although currently uh, it's sort of bundled in with biotechnology, and that's bundled in with uh, genetic engineering, and that's bundled in with GMOs, and especially in terms of regulations and. Uh, maybe the public's perception. But some people uh, are calling for less regulation uh, and maybe have less uh, less uh, against cisgenic type applications of, uh, of biotechnology where you're not really moving genes from another species. RNAi is a, is, is a biological process in which RNA molecules inhibit gene expression um, and this is a, a form of gene silencing, and, and I've got a link there for YouTube uh, if you'd like to watch. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good YouTube. It's part of its cartoons, part of its some interviews with some scientists uh, to explain a little bit more about RNAi, uh, which the I stands for interference, um, and uh, maybe help you understand that concept a little bit more. Now, RNAi could be used in a transgenic matter or a cisgenic matter. Uh, the most of the applications, or all the applications I'm aware of, are in a cisgenic fashion, but could be used in either one of those uh, techniques. And then we have a uh, subgenic, and this is the newest field, and it includes several different types of uh, tools or strategies, uh, techniques, uh, including talons, uh, zinc fingered. Uh, Uh, that, uh, the subgenic includes all kinds of gene editing, which includes uh, talons, um, zinc finger nucleases, um, and probably the one you've heard about mostly lately is CRISPR. And these techniques can use, be used to amplify or delete a gene, insert a gene, silence a gene, or repress a gene. Um, so, uh, and I've got a link there to maybe explain to you a little bit more about what CRISPR is about. Uh, and this is probably the most precise uh, of the techniques, especially CRISPR when you compare it to the other subgenic uh, techniques. CRISPR would be the most pre precise and most efficient and what uh, you hear the most excitement about uh, in, uh, today. So if we look at uh, different ways that man can manipulate plants and you have your columns there, you have hybrids, just cross, just sexual crosses there we mean by hybrids and uh, between plants, uh, which is what it, most people are familiar with and, and most people think is natural. Um, and then we have polyploids where uh, genomes are duplicated or added. A lot of our crop species are polyploids. Uh, you can see some examples there, strawberries, wheat, bananas, brassicas, uh, certainly uh, something like seedless watermelon. Um, mutation breeding is the third column and that's where you induce mutations because a lot of times what we're doing in, in traditional breeding is selecting for mutations that might occur in nature and of course most mutations are, are negative but sometimes those mutations are positive and, and man has over the year over millennia has selected for positive mutations. So this is a method to speed up mutations with either chemicals or radiation and to induce uh, uh, those mutations and then to make selections for, for, for mutations that are positive uh, in terms of man using that species of plant. 
Uh, there are examples of uh, where plants have crossed species barriers um, without genetic in engineering or biotechnology. Um, probably the most famous example of that over time is wheat, which is uh, where a couple um, non not closely related plants crossed uh, to make wheat the modern wheat we know today. Uh, Pluots, tangelos, and some apples are other examples. Uh, and then transgenics, which is the one where we're moving a gene from one species to another, and that's the, you know, the epitome of a GMO in most people's mind, and that's uh, uh, the one that's probably the most concerned to people. And then uh, on the last column is cisgenics, uh, and that's uh, uh, in, a, in a lot of cases you're not moving a gene from another species. Okay, so if we look at some of the things that might be of interest. To, to, your, to the public. Uh, the first uh, row there is examples, to give you some examples of, of uh, what, what we have in, in each breeding category. Um, and then the next uh, row is whether it transfers genes uh, from one species to the other. And the only one that, that does that uh, is crossing barriers uh, that, uh, that fourth column, that's what happened in nature. So it does happen in nature, those examples. And then the fifth column, transgenics, is when we use biotechnology uh, to make that occur. Um, and then the next is, does it occur in nature? And we see those crossing the species barrier, like the wheat example. That does happen sometimes, but it's rare. Uh, and it, certainly with transgenics, it's pretty common uh, that, uh, that genes from one species are moved uh, to another. And it does actually occur in nature. And you may have seen uh, there was a, some recent news about uh, sweet potatoes and that, uh, that they found some where agrobacterium had actually uh, been in, inserted into uh, sweet potatoes um, thousands of years ago. So that, that does happen in nature also. Uh, then the human intervention uh, is hybrids, of course. We've been doing that for a long time for crop improvement. Uh, we've had breeders here at NC State working on that for uh, since almost the, the start of NC State. Uh, polyploids uh, can that happens in nature, but it can be induced uh, with some chemicals to induce polyploidy. Um, mutation breeding, of course, mutations occur in nature, but when in this column we're talking about chemical or radiation induced, and yes, that's used to in, in, uh, uh, introduce variation uh, to select for crop improvement. And uh, there are a lot of a lot of commercial products, uh, Ruby Red Grapefruit's an example. Um, a lot of a lot of products that were uh, that are commercially available and eaten um, that were produced using mutation breeding. Crossing species barriers, uh, yes, uh, human intervention can be involved there. Uh, Triticale is an example, uh, cross between wheat and rye, uh, where uh, human intervention was involved. Uh, transgenic, yes, you, you, human intervention, of course, is involved there and in cisgenics. I think one of the most things that's most telling uh, is the number, that next row, the number of genes that affect it. Uh, because one of the things we hear about is that scientists don't know what they're doing uh, with biotechnology. And uh, then on the other side, we hear that it's very precise. Well, the origin of why they would, why somebody would, a scientist would say it's more precise, is is right here. It's one of the reasons. So when you're when you're making crosses, and you cross a peanut with a, a wild peanut or a, uh, uh, a closely related species uh, um, peanut, um, you're moving a lot of genes. 50% you know, of the genes are, are shifting around. So you're, there's a lot of unknown DNA being involved in those kind of crosses. 
certainly that for the most part that's never uh, caused a lot of problems but there are examples where uh, just through regular plant breeding we've come up with plants um, uh, that uh, uh, like the Lenape potato where uh, we increased toxins in potatoes just with traditional breeding so there are a lot of unknowns when you're moving that many genes around um, polyploidy um, your 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 affecting a lot of genes when you're duplicating the, the chromosomes. Um, mutation breeding, uh, you know there's really no way to, to, to know exactly how many genes you've affected. You're, you're, you're blasting uh, the DNA to try to make changes so you're, you're making a lot of changes and, and making selections from there and you may make a selection for one uh, phenotype but you don't know what other genes you've, uh, you've affected. Uh, and crossing species barriers, uh, you're, you're affecting a, a lot of, of genes there too. And here's where the where people talk about precision when you're talking about biotechnology is that you're only moving a very few number of genes or changing a very few number of genes depending on which biotechnology you're actually talking about. So does any scientist know what the gene is, what it codes for, what that protein, uh, what what protein is 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 coded for, so they they have an idea of that protein that they're introducing into the plant and what its potential toxic uh, toxicity is and its pot potential allergenicity is. Um, and if we move on down, you can take your time and, and look through this chart. Um, you know, one of the things that probably a lot of the public would find surprising is the the row there where it says plant patentable and we t uh, the public tends to think that only patents only apply to transgenics or GMOs and you can see here that uh, in several of these that, that not several all of these columns are potentially plant patentable so plant patents have been around for a while and those and those laws uh, governing plant patents have, have changed over time. So is there any documented adversity um, with hybrids? Yes, uh, I mentioned the Lenape potato. Uh, nothing that I could find uh, or I'm aware of in, in terms of polyploidy or mutation breeding. Certainly there's a possibility there. Um, and crossing species barriers, there are some uh, some examples of where that has uh, caused some adversity. Uh, and so far, none in transgenic or cisgenics. Now, there was a, a Brazil nut in, introduced into a soybean at one time uh, that uh, was uh, did introduce an allergen to the soybean, but that was found out it, during early in the process and. Uh, that plant, that 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 uh, product never got close to being commercially available. So certainly, it's possible that uh, there could be something uh, affected uh, or adversely. But so far, nothing has has been found commercially that's adverse. Uh, environmental assessment. And you see the first four columns there, there are no environmental effect, uh, assessments. Uh, and, and that's one of the complaints of a lot of the uh, of, uh, the people that are involved in, in genetic engineering is that here you have chemical mutation and you have a lot of unknown changes to the DNA in the plant. Uh, and they're, they're, nobody's asking for labeling, nobody's asking for environmental assessment, nobody's asking for uh, nutritional difference trials or, or, or proof of uh, nutritional uh, documenting uh, the, the nutritional content of the plants. Uh, whereas in transgenics, certainly there are people that are there are environmental assessments are required and um, a lot of people want to see a label for it. So a lot of people have a hard time understanding why that, why the public wants to have uh, 
real stringent regulations uh, for biotechnology compared to some of the some of the other techniques that have been around for a long time that are much less precise. And it probably just goes to that it's new uh, and uh, and people tend to be uh, afraid of new technology. Um, the one row there, the third from the bottom, is organically acceptable. And, and again, uh, all those columns, even though they're especially mutation breeding, uh, there's a lot of unknown changes to DNA. They're not accepted uh, uh, for organic. Uh, I mean, they are accepted for or organic, whereas transgenics or GMOs are not ex uh, acceptable for organic. And then one of the things you see there is the, the next to the last road, time for a new variety. And one of the, one of the, the, the pros for biotechnology is that it reduces the amount of time uh, from a concept to to developing a new variety and getting it out where a farmer could use it. So the next the next um, slide set I'm going to do is is in more detail about these traits. I think it's important to think when you think about what a GMO is, it's not just what we've been talking about how they're made, but what do they mean. And what do they mean to the public? What do they mean uh, to society? And that's uh, all depends on what type of trait there is, because there's a host of traits that are, uh, and most of them there are examples that are commercially available in these categories, and a lot in the pipeline. So we have a lot of traits involved. Um, we have herbicide tolerance, tolerant plants um, or crops. So the crops can withstand a herbicide that otherwise they could not uh, tolerate. We have insect tolerant plants, so the plant produces a toxin to kill the pest. We have uh, cr uh, crops that have improved nutrition. Uh, we have disease resistant crops. We have stress tolerant crops. Um, crops that have um, that can be stored longer and uh, have less spoilage losses. The crops that have been developed to produce medicines or vaccines, uh, and there are crops that have been developed specifically for uh, industrial uses. So there are a lot of individual traits, and I think when you start thinking about GMOs and whether you, they're good or bad, it's really good to look at each one on a case-by-case -case basis, at least on a trait-type basis. Uh, and, and because there, you hear a lot of wholesale arguments, across the board arguments like GMOs increase uh, um, pesticides or they decrease pesticides. When in fact it depends on what traits you're talking about. Certainly with insect tolerance and disease resistant, we've seen uh, pretty huge decreases in, in pesticide use. In herbicide tolerance, it depends on the specific crop you're talking about and the location. In some cases we've seen some increases in herbicide use, some cases decreases. So uh, I think it's important to stress to the public that all these, we've got all these different technologies involved. They're not all equal. Certainly CRISPR is different than, than uh, transgenics uh, or could be. Um, and certainly one trait May have more uh, uh, more value to society than a, than another trait, and it's uh, I think it's a, it's a mistake to probably lump them all together and say I'm um, um, all for everything and uh, or all against everything when there's when there's a lot of different technologies involved and a lot of different type of traits that are being produced. Uh, and I put this slide in here just to give you an idea of where uh, uh, genetically engineered crops are being produced in the world. So uh, you see even some countries in uh, Europe. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, some in increased activity and interest in Africa and in Asia uh, at this time um, uh, for for uh, for accepting genetically engineered crops. Certainly. 
the the Americas, North and South America, uh, have have a lot of uh, genetically engineered crops. So what are those crops? Um, we have, as I listed before, we have insect resistance and herbicide tolerance and and various different traits, but we have certain crops. Some crops have more than one trait. Some crops only have one trait. So right now, the only crops that are commercially available are cotton in the United States. Cotton, sugar beet, soybeans, corn, canola, papaya, alfalfa, and summer squash. <coughs> and you see that uh, Several of those crops, uh, the majority of the United States acreage is, is dedicated to genetically engineered uh, varieties. Um, and then uh, several uh, have a couple there, squash and alfalfa have less, less than 50%. Um, and there are two new, brand new, genetically engineered uh, crops that have just been approved, uh, innate potato. Uh, so, and uh, Arctic apple. So they've just been approved, but I don't think you could find them yet. I read the other day about the first planting of uh, Arctic apple, and I think it was in New York. Um, and that was developed in Canada by a small com company uh, in Canada with about seven employees. Uh, the N8 potato. Um, uh, what the N8 potato does is it has uh, it reduced re has reduced bruising and spoiling and bruising so when you cut it it doesn't turn brown as much it, it doesn't bruise you don't get as much losses from bruising so it helps with storage potential and it's also uh, has reduced acrylamides in the potato and that's a, a, a chemical that's produced when you fry potatoes uh, that has been linked to cancer so there's some some health benefit there and then the arctic apple is a is an apple that's been the the one I talked about that was produced in Canada. It's been produced uh, in the apples on the top are Arctic, the apples on the bottom are conventional. And as you can see in the picture, they've been produced that they do not turn brown when you cut them. So that's to try to increase the the, the consumption of apples, especially with kids who uh, are not likely to pick up a whole apple and. Uh, and they're not likely to pick up a, a brown sliced apple. So, um, and lastly, there are some other products that certainly, you know, probably a lot of people are not aware that insulin is made using biotechnology. Uh, several uh, big medicines are made with uh, biotechnology, um, but there are also it's it's being developed in, in animal agriculture and other areas of, of our society. Um, one thing that probably a lot of people would be surprised is that 90 percent of our cheese is made with a uh, chymosin that's been uh, and, and this chymosin is, is uh, uh, made using biotechnology. So the way they used to make uh, cheese was they uh, obtained rennet from the stomach of calves, and uh, that uh, got harder to do when uh, uh, veal production decreased uh, with animal rights activities, and uh, so they tried to find other ways to 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 not have to use the the calf stomachs to to get this uh, chymosin, um, which coagulates the, the milk to make cheese. And they found that they several enzymes from plants that uh, and back and micro uh, microbes that would do that, but they didn't have a good flavor. So they what they did was they took a, a gene from a a bovine from a cow and put it into uh, a bacteria, and that bacteria is now used to make this chymo chymosin. Uh, and used to manufacture most of the cheese in the United States. So that's uh, that's it for um, for what is a GMO. And in the next uh, question, I'll go a little bit more into those traits and who benefits from those traits.
and what those traits are all about. Thank you.